Hello everyone, that was a passage from Agutior or Agitiuer in the Galicianer pronunciation, a Yiddish New Year's song written by David Meyerowitz and sung by Joseph Feldman. And this is historian explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. This lecture will be Myth of the Month number 13 on feudalism. If you want to hear all of my Myths of the Month, please go to my Patreon page and become a supporter at any level, even if it's just a dollar. So I've been reading and researching about feudalism for a while now, and I'm going to try to break down precisely what that word means and how it's been used over time to refer to phenomena almost always in the Middle Ages. So it's a myth that's tied very closely to the myth of the Middle Ages. But before I get into parsing what it does or does not mean and how it's been applied, I'm going to first stop and just tell a story. A story that I'm going to lay out, improvise off the top of my head. It's a story about three men and it takes place somewhere in Western Europe, sometime in the Middle Ages. And the first of these men, we'll just call him Andy, he's ostensibly a normal fellow, not very smart or very stupid, not very tall or very short, not very honest or dishonest, just an average man. But he is special in that he is a knight. He is specially trained in the art of warfare on horseback. And not surprisingly, as a knight, he is also a lord. That means he has certain special prerogatives and powers within a particular delimited territory, a local area, a manor, say. And on this manor, we'll call it Dollywood, Andy has the ability to collect certain fees and tolls from people who pass through his zone of control. He's able to demand certain payments like crops or livestock from the peasants who live on that manor. And he's able to demand, perhaps most importantly, certain services, labor, like service in his household or his stable from the adult men of the manor. And these rights and prerogatives that Andy has in Dollywood are very important to him because that's what makes it possible for him to maintain not only his manor house and his household, but his stables, his fine horses, his armor, his collection of weaponry, and his team of, you could say, assistant fighters or assistant warriors around him called sergeants. And Andy really needs to have all of these things in working order because Andy has a superior lord above him. We'll call him Bobby. And every once in a while, Bobby calls upon Andy, his vassal, to come and help him and serve him in war. That is what Andy is trained for. And whenever this happens, Andy has to gather together his best servants and retainers and put on his armor and mount his horse and ride off to wherever Bobby is fighting his wars. And at some point, this war will end. Maybe Andy will be victorious and take a prisoner and ransom him for some money. Or maybe Andy himself will be captured and taken prisoner and have to be ransomed back. And one way or another, the conflict will be concluded and Andy, hopefully, will head back to Dollywood and take up the previous life he'd been living all along. Now, this, of course, can carry on for some time, but eventually 
Andy is going to get too old. He's going to want to retire. Or maybe he's going to die. Perhaps he'll be killed on the battlefield or be killed by some wonderful camp disease like smallpox. Or for one reason or another, he will lose the ability to carry out his responsibilities. Now, luckily, Andy has an heir and successor, and that is his eldest son. We'll call him Charlie. Luckily, by the time Andy is old enough that he wants to retire from his position and maybe go off and live out his golden years in a cottage or in a convent or a monastery, Charlie is old enough to step in and take up his roles and responsibilities. And Charlie, like Andy, has been trained from childhood in the very specialized art of combat on horseback. So after Andy dies or retires, Charlie steps in to his role at the manor house and prepares himself to serve Bobby at war when necessary. But before he can take up all of Andy's special titles and powers, like collecting rent or labor levies or tolls, he has to have his titles confirmed by his superior lord, Bobby. And so he packs up all of his finest clothes and his best servants and retainers, and he marches off to Bobby's palace. And once he is there, he is invited into a fine hall that has been specially set up for a ceremony. And Bobby receives Charlie and has Charlie kneel before him on the ground. And Bobby puts forth his sword, and Andy puts his hands on either side of the sword. Bobby asks Charlie to commit himself to service, after which then Bobby puts his own hands over Charlie's hands, thus confirming that he accepts him as his vassal. Once this ceremony is over, the sword is put aside, and then Charlie puts his hand on a Bible and swears a very long and elaborate Christian oath to give fealty or faithful service and loyalty to his lord. Bobby. Once this is done, Charlie is able to pack up his goods and gather back his servants and head back to Dollywood and serve as the lord of that manor and also, whenever necessary, ride off on his horse to serve Lord Bobby at war. And so the cycle continues on and on. So if one were to take this story that I just told about Andy, Bobby, and Charlie and present it to a scholar, a medievalist, a linguist, maybe even a historian around the year, say, 1900, it would sound quite familiar and even ordinary to them. And in general, they would say that Andy, Bobby, and Charlie just did a feudalism. They acted out a set of common practices, norms, and rituals that regulated the relationships between superior and inferior lords, a set of rules that we could broadly call feudal and that were repeatedly observed and acted out by many different people all around different parts of Central and Western Europe or the medieval West through hundreds of years of the Middle Ages from about the 700s to the 1300s. And this broad set of rules and norms that we just saw acted out would look more or less the same, regardless of whether the superior lord, Bobby, was a baron or even a king or an emperor. It was a structure, a template of practices and relationships that you could apply to all kinds of lords and sometimes ladies all around the medieval West. And hence we can say that this society where these norms and laws held sway was feudal, and the system could be called feudalism. So, so far, so good, right? Sounds like we've basically put our finger on the thing that we're talking about. And we can now wrap up this lecture, close this window, and go back to listening to Chapo Trap House. But something is wrong. Actually, several things are wrong 
with this picture. There are a number of reasons why some people might stop and say, wait, the question of what is feudalism has not really been answered. And in fact, only bigger and more difficult problems have been raised in the process. So let's go through this one small step at a time. What are some reasons why this little story that I just told doesn't clearly answer our question of what is feudalism? Well, as I said, Lord Andy and then later his heir, Lord Charlie, have certain rights and prerogatives over their manor, their zone of territory that they control, which might be just a manor, or in other cases, it might be several manors, it might be a large zone. And the people who are subject to those prerogatives and powers are what we might generally call peasants, common or poor people who mostly worked the land, although some did other tasks and occupations. And they often had to render certain dues or fees to Lord Andy or Lord Bobby. Maybe payment in cash if that was available anywhere, but more likely payment in some sort of goods like harvested crops or some goats, some chickens, or labor service. Is that feudalism? The word feudal in the Middle Ages, we'll talk about the derivation of where that word comes from, but when it was used, it generally applied to the relationship between Andy and Bobby, between one lord and their superior or sometimes you might say a vassal and his lord. It was not applied to commoners and the things that were imposed upon them. But those rights and duties that the lords could use to make demands upon peasants, they were necessary and integral for Andy and Charlie to render the service that they owed to their superior lord, namely putting on their armor and getting on their horse and riding off to support him in war. None of that would have been possible without the base of support beneath them from the peasants, so to speak. So is that not part of feudalism? Now, this might seem like a kind of trivial fringe question, but in fact, it massively changes the meaning of the word depending on whether we count that or not. It changes whether we're just talking about men of the warrior class or lords or nobles, as they were sometimes later called in the late Middle Ages, or when we say feudalism, are we talking about a whole network of rights and duties that affect apparently everybody, or at least most people, and that conditioned people's lives and activities almost everywhere. Now, if you've heard or read about the Middle Ages and medieval society before, you might know that sometimes some scholars and commentators liked to neatly divide society into three basic estates. The nobility, who we've been talking about, which includes guys like Andy and Bobby and Charlie and their wives and children, then there was commoners, right, which includes the peasants. But then the first estate, the most high status estate in the medieval world, at least in theory, was the clergy, the people of the church. Now, the church, they did a lot of praying and they said masses and they performed funerals and all those sorts of churchy things. But they also controlled a lot of land and often had tenants living on that land who owed them servants or fees or rents. And sometimes some churchmen even went off to war. In the high and late Middle Ages, they weren't supposed to do that. But in the early Middle Ages, it was pretty common and sometimes even happened later too. They also could collect taxes, engage in diplomacy. In other words, the clergy were very much part of medieval society, and often they did a lot of the same sorts of things as Andy, Bobby, and Charlie. There are even many known instances of people kneeling and swearing oaths of homage and fealty to church officials, just as I described Charlie doing to Bobby. So, another question is, what about the church? Are they not part of feudalism? Are the things that they did not part of feudal law or custom or feudalism. 
If so, then again, we have to further expand our definition of what we mean by feudalism to include a whole other estate of people. How about others who might fall under the heading of commoners, but who were not clergy, nobles, or peasants? There were some of them too. How about the merchants who occasionally came around to Dollywood with wares to sell or requests to buy items like crops or animals? Are they feudalism? What about the entertainers, the players, the acrobats, the jugglers who sometimes came around from village to village and manor to manor and offered to entertain Lord Charlie and his household in their hall in return for food and lodging. Is that feudalism or is it not feudalism? What about this whole other entity that I just mentioned that doesn't exist on Dollywood at all, which is villages and towns? Entities that often were self-governing within their walls and had their own councils, sometimes even held elections. What about them? Are they feudalism? What if those towns and villages, like Lord Bobby and Lord Charlie, also had to send fighters and give military support to Lord Bobby when called upon? Is that feudalism? And what about the various deviations and variations? For instance, what if there was a slightly different manner where Lord Andy has his rights and powers and is a knight and can fight on horseback, but is not understood to owe any military service to Lord Bobby, but simply is concerned with protecting his own little domain, his own fiefdom, you might say. What if he doesn't owe military service, but he does make payments and fees to Lord Bobby every once in a while? Is that feudalism? There's an enormous array of different possible patterns and configurations by which people, nobles, commoners, clergy, might organize themselves, even assuming that you have clear demarcations in the first place of who's a noble, who's a commoner, and who's clergy. So what we have in effect here is two very different poles of how you could view feudalism and how you could apply that word to medieval society, and a whole range of gray area in between them where you might land. So on the one hand, we have the strictest and narrowest understanding of what feudalism means. You could say feudalism basically means feudal law, the specific set of laws and practices regarding the relations between lords and their vassals, which means inferior lords who owe them service and who render them oaths, like I just described, oaths of homage and fealty, and who hold fiefs, so laws and customs around the control of fiefs, and fief is a medieval word for a piece of territory that is understood to be under the control of a certain lord in a limited and conditional way, in the sense that they are able to demand certain services and fees from the people in that territory in return for providing military service to their superior lord. So, in other words, basically, the narrow definition of feudalism is it is the things that Andy, Bobby, and Charlie did to one another. That's feudalism. On the other end, the opposite extreme is to say that feudalism is a complete and encompassing social system that basically embraced everything that happened in the Middle Ages. The relationships between Andy and Bobby and Charlie and their tenants and their servants and their superior lords and the king or the emperor and the monastery that might have existed on their manor as well, where perhaps Andy went to live when he retired from his knighthood. All of this counts as feudalism. And this approach has been taken by some social historians historians of the Annales school, that sort of school of thought that arose in 19th century and 20th century France, where you try to look at kind of broad totalizing changes and shifts in how society works. And also this view has been taken up in different ways by Marx and Marxist historians. 
So according to Marx and Engels too, in the Communist Manifesto, feudalism was a mode of production and it was the mode of production that basically defined the whole medieval world. So feudalism exists in contrast then, of course, to capitalism, the mode of production of the modern world. And hence, in this Marxian view, feudalism was a necessary stage of civilization, a kind of form of life, a form of civilization that society had to go through on its way towards, eventually, socialism. And Marxists sometimes speak positively or celebrate the overthrow of feudalism in favor of capitalism, not because they loved capitalism, but, but, but because they saw that as a necessary step towards the final socialist revolution. Now, this way of talking about feudalism as a mode of production upon which all of medieval society was built, this view actually interestingly enough, is the one that has really trickled down into popular consciousness. When people talk about feudalism, especially lay people, not necessarily scholars, not anymore, but lay people, when they bring up feudalism and they have to explain what that means, they tend to talk about serfs or peasants, so the sort of laboring lower class of society, and they talk about control of land. When I put forward the question on Twitter, how would you explain or define what is feudalism? One friend of mine, who's a very educated and informed person, said, well, land and serfs and stuff. Although actually she used a different word for stuff. And that's about as good an answer as you can expect to get from the vast majority of people, if they even have any notion of what feudalism is at all. Another friend of mine, who is a historian, said, quote, a society whose material basis is land ownership using the labor of serfs with networks of social and political obligation built out of and upon that basis. So I think you can see here how there's a Marxian imprint here, right? The notion that feudalism is not simply the relationships between Andy and Bobby and Charlie, these different lords with their different stations but rather it is all-encompassing and that it is built not from the top down. So the first view, the narrow view, tends to see it as a, a top-down arrangement, but rather it's sort of bottom-up. It starts from the relationship between the local lord, like Andy, and his peasants or serfs. And this word serfs comes up over and over again. Now, there's a lot one can say about this view of feudalism or this understanding of feudalism. But one thing we have to point out right away is that serfs should not be in the definition at all. A serf is a specific type of peasant, as I've talked about a little bit before. It's a peasant who is bound to a particular territory or piece of land and who has no freedom of movement, cannot change social station, but is basically more or less like a slave. And we're often compared to slaves in the early Middle Ages. Serfdom was not the general norm anywhere in the Middle Ages. It did exist some in some places, especially in the early Middle Ages. It tended to die out over time through the high and late Middle Ages. And it was fairly rare and unusual. Most peasants had some kind of title to their piece of land, a title that they could choose to pass on to their heirs or sell or assign to somebody else. Besides that, many peasants weren't farmers at all. Many of them were craftsmen like potters or smiths. Some became merchants. Some moved into towns. And serfdom was a very narrow and specific social status that was not the common norm in most of medieval society. And as I've said before, the real heyday of serfdom, where serfdom becomes the general normal status for most peasants, is in the early modern era, in the 15, 16, and 1700s, in Eastern Europe, in places like Poland, Russia, Ukraine, where the nobility has the power to reduce most of the peasantry to a condition of serfdom in order to exploit their labor to produce grain, which was the big export of Eastern Europe. So it was really a creation of the early modern era 
in that region. That's not to say it didn't happen in the medieval West as well. It did, but it was pretty unusual and it generally didn't last. So we have to throw that word serfdom out, you know, and it's very revealing that almost always when you ask people today, talk about feudalism, they bring up the word serfs. They bring up the sort of most frightening, extreme image of the sort of suffering, oppressed, impoverished peasant. Even though, as I've said before, that was not the pattern, not in law and custom and not in material conditions either. This view of feudalism as a kind of all-encompassing, totalizing system that defined the whole Middle Ages, also it's often described as pyramidal and hierarchical and militaristic. Many people will say there was a kind of pyramid right, uh, built upon the peasants or serfs at the bottom, leading up step by step to a ruler, and militaristic, right? It was geared towards war. This is the way, for instance, you can see John Adams describe the Middle Ages in his dissertation on the canon and feudal law, where he says that the feudal law is a law that is suited to an armed camp and that basically treats society as a kind of permanent armed camp. And all of these views and definitions of feudalism as a kind of broad encompassing system they tend to focus very much on things that aren't properly part of feudal law as it was discussed and described in the Middle Ages. For instance, no lawyer or scholar or ruler in the Middle Ages talked about, say, peasants rendering two dozen eggs to their lord every month as part of feudal law. Feudal law meant control over fiefs, and their relationship to their superior lords. So this view, this sort of broad view, you could say, of what feudalism is, is not based in any medieval sources. It's a retroactive creation that people in the modern world have used and applied retrospectively. And it's based, as I'll talk about more, it's based on an assumption of coherence, a sort of assumption that all of these different practices, rules, customs about who owes what to whom, who owes labor to whom, who owes goods to whom, who has authority to dispense justice over whom, that all of these things sort of add up to something consistent. And that at base, this whole coherent structure is built upon a labor system. And this, again, is the sort of Marxian legacy to say that feudalism is not a set of laws about land tenure or service to a lord. Feudalism is fundamentally, at base, a labor system. Okay, so this, of course, raises the question of how do we adjudicate? How do we weigh which kind of definition of feudalism is better or is more useful in describing the Middle Ages? Well, one thing we could do firstly to adjudicate is look in a dictionary. What, what are we supposed to be taking as the meaning of feudalism from the OED or Merriam-Webster? When we look at dictionary definitions, we tend to see a sort of combination, a sort of hodgepodge throwing together of both senses of the broad social system definition of feudalism together with the very specific narrow definition, which is based on very technical rules that only apply to relations among lords within the upper class. So for example, if we look at Merriam-Webster, Merriam-Webster has a two-part definition of feudalism. And the first one says, quote, the system of political organization prevailing in Europe from the 9th to about the 15th centuries having as its basis the relation of lord to vassal, with all land held in fee, and as chief characteristics homage, the service of tenants under arms and in court, wardship and forfeiture. So notice how this first part of the definition first casts this very wide net and says this was a system of political organization prevailing in Europe from the 9th to the 15th centuries. So it's the sort of regime of power, of political life, over a whole continent for six centuries. But then when it tries to explain, okay, but what was it? How did it work? We get this barrage of very specific technical terms 
that you're only going to know if you study medieval feudal law, like vassal, land in fee, homage, wardship, and forfeiture. So as we go on, I'm going to explain and define a little more what these terms mean, how they've been used, and whether they make any sense or not, particularly vassal and homage. Those are important ones. But others like wardship are like very, you know, <laughs> obscure, arcane details of feudal law, which we won't even worry about for now. But notice how there's this weird sort of disjuncture, you could say, between saying this is a broad system. They don't say economic system or social system, but they say political organization. But then it's this very narrow technical collection of rules and customs. So on the one hand, it seems as if by this definition, feudalism must be something very specific and distinctive to medieval Europe. It was something with all of these very peculiar and obscure details, and it was a European phenomenon. But at the same time, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, like a lot of scholars too, also applies the term to all sorts of other societies outside of Europe. And for instance, the second part of the definition in Merriam-Webster says, quote, any of various political or social systems similar to medieval feudalism. Well, what counts as similar to medieval feudalism? Do you have to have wardship? Do you have to have homage? What if you don't? What if you've got three of these things, but not all five? What, okay, how, how similar does it have to be to be feudalism? And as you may know, there are commentators who have taken the word feudal or feudalism and applied it, for example, to Tokugawa Japan and said Tokugawa Japan in the 16, 1700s was a feudal society. Some people have applied it to pre-Columbian Mexico and the Aztec Empire. Well, uh, <laughs> okay, so now, now feudalism has kind of taken on this life of its own even beyond Europe, and we have an even bigger blurry boundary of what do we count as feudalism. How feudal does it have to be to be feudalism? So there's a lot of confusion here, which the dictionary on its own cannot adjudicate. And so what are we going to do? How will we adjudicate and figure out where to draw the line and how to create some kind of consistent picture of what we mean by feudalism? Okay, so that is the sort of conceptual question. What exactly do we mean? What do we count? How do we figure out what falls into the basket and what does not? What sort of people count as part of feudalism? What medieval phenomena and practices count as feudalism? And even beyond Europe, what counts or does not count as feudalism? A second problem, so if we, if we bracket that conceptual definitional problem, a second problem that we haven't even brought up is, did the story that I just told about Andy, Bobby, and Charlie ever actually happen? You can probably tell those are characters I made up, right? But maybe as I was telling the story, you were thinking, oh, well, you know, this is probably an ideal type that more or less describes real things that real people did in particular places and times. They acted out these, this cycle of actions. But do we really know that? Did this cycle really ever take place? And if so, when, where, and why? So this is not a question of definitions. This is a question of historical facts and evidence. So these are two big problems that one can bring up in response to my neat little story about Andy, Bobby, and Charlie. So let's start with the first one before we then try to pin down the second one. Let's say we try to figure out, does the narrow definition or the broad definition fit well and describe well and clarify well what actually happened in the medieval West? And let's start with the first version of the story, the narrow definition, where basically what Andy, Bobby, and Charlie did counts as feudalism. So this is a non-Marxist definition, one that is rooted in political and legal history, most of all, and not in sort of broad theories about labor and economics. So 
This narrower definition, the non-Marxist definition, is rooted much more in what medieval texts actually referred to as feudal and how they used that word. And notice I say the word feudal because nobody in the Middle Ages ever talked about feudalism. You know, we love isms. They didn't talk about feudalism, but they did talk about feudal law, which means law relating to the holding of fiefs. And I'll explain a little more later what is a fief. So it's more or less the story of Andy, Bobby, and Charlie as I laid it out. But what makes that feudal? What does that mean? So probably the most popular and maybe the most impactful explanation of feudalism in this narrow sense was laid out by an American historian named Carl Stevenson in a classic 1942 book simply called Medieval Feudalism. And Carl Stevenson argues that feudalism was a common set of arrangements and customs and practices that always involved the granting of a fief in return for military service and fealty. So at root, it is the combination, the joining together of two things, vassalage and fiefdom. Okay, what is vassalage? So vassalage, according to Stevenson, was a bond of service, sort of like brotherhood, which probably derived originally from Germanic customs. So if you remember my lecture about the Dark Age, the Germanic tribes and small nations that migrated into the Roman Empire, they tended to center around kings or chieftains who would then have a warrior band around them that was pledged to serve and protect them. And in return, the king would give them safety and honor and gold. So vassalage is a term that we use for a possibly similar relationship that evolved out of that, where you'd have a subordinate called a vassal and a lord or seigneur in French. And this lord might be a king or a nobleman or even a churchman sometimes. But the vassal, although they were in a subordinate position and they agreed to render certain services to the Lord, it was voluntary. Nobody was forced to be a vassal. It was entered into voluntarily and it was understood to be an honorable relationship to both the Lord and the vassal. It is not a servile position. It is not subjection. And in all of these ways, it's very much like the comitatus or companion relationship that we see Tacitus describe among the Germans in Germania. The term, it seems, was derived from an old Celtic word, probably Gaulish word, guas, which originally meant boy, but seems to have evolved to mean sort of a, a respected servant. In this way, it's similar to other terms like knight and thane, which were used in Britain, that also originally derived from words for boy, but over time evolved to denote a sort of honorable position of an honorable servant. The relationship of vassalage was sealed by a ceremony of homage and fealty. So homage is the laying on of hands. So I, where I described Charlie kneeling and putting his hands around Bobby's sword and then Bobby putting his hands over Charlie's hands. That is a ceremony of homage, and it comes from the old Latin word homo, or French om, which just means man. So you could see in a way, it's sort of when the vassal pays homage, it's like the boy is becoming a man. He's manning up. And then fealty is where you put your hand on a Bible and you give a Christianized oath, pledging loyalty to the Lord. Vassalage involved certain clear expectations. Mainly, you would fight for your lord when called upon, and your lord and the vassal were supposed to protect each other. There was a mutual loyalty and reciprocal duties. The bond of vassalage could be dissolved if one or the other party broke the agreement and failed in their duties, such as abandoning the other, setting out and fighting or rebelling against your lord, one rule apparently that medieval lawyers included was if the Lord had sex with the vassal's wife, that meant the, <laughs> the agreement was off. There were things like this that set boundaries on the relationship of vassalage. And 
vassals, according to Carl Stevenson's argument, were customarily granted a fief. So a fief is a type of benefice. It's not a type of land, precisely. It's a type of benefice. And a benefice is a granting of special rights and privileges, such as the ability to collect rents or taxes or to demand service from the people in a particular territory. So having a benefice didn't exactly mean that you owned this piece of territory. You know, it didn't mean you could sell it and trade it on the market. It didn't mean you could kick the residents out unless you had a legal justification to do so. It just meant you had certain limited rights and prerogatives to receive goods or services from that zone. And benefices that were granted to vassals came to be understood as a way of supporting that vassal to enable them to give the military service that they owe. So it seems natural, right? Instead of paying your vassal, you'd give them a benefice over a certain zone. And a military benefice given to a fighter, to a warrior vassal, was called a fief. It came to be called a fief. And that comes from a very old root, an Indo-European root, feos, which means property or holding of some sort. And this evolved in English into fief. And in Old French, it evolved into feudum or feodum. And from that word came the adjective feodal, which means just having to do with fiefs. And so our word feudalism comes from that root of feodal. And so you could say, ultimately, at bottom, the word feudalism just means fiefing or fiefiness or doing fiefs. So a fief was specifically given to a vassal, and very often the ruler, the overlord of a certain realm, like the king or emperor, would grant a fief to one of their vassals, to someone who was that they trusted, who was close to them, and from whom they expected service and protection. The fief that they would grant was very often a, a large area, maybe a, you know, a duchy or a county, something like that, or just a big collection of manors. And in return, the vassal was expected to furnish to the king or the emperor a certain number of knights, cavalry warriors. And it might be a large number, such as 10 or 12, which for that time was a pretty big feat to get together 10 or 12 knights. And those knights who had to give service might include the vassal himself, and it might include others that he retains or hires. There were also sometimes some unusual fiefs with particular specific requirements, like in return for holding this fief, the vassal has to provide a garrison to a castle and maintain that castle. If a vassal who held a fief broke their oath, such as by failing to serve their lord, that was called felony. And if one committed a felony, then the fief was forfeit and the ruler could take it back. Now also, if the fief was very large and the vassal was expected to provide many fighters, that could be quite a burden. And so the vassal might sub-infudate. So they could take their big realm, which might have, say, 20 manors in it, and they might say, I need supporters who will come fight with me and join me and help me fill out my quota of knights. So they could break off pieces of their fief and give out, say, five manors to this distant relative or three manors to this adventurer they met on the road. And so give out sort of sub-fiefs, right? It's my fief, I can sub-infudate if I want to. And then those sub-vassals might further sub-infudate. And you might have vassals upon vassals upon vassals all the way down eventually to individual manors, these small, self-supporting, self-contained villages. So it's a lot like, you know, subletting. And as Carl Stevenson points out, this process of giving out fiefs and then sub-infudating them into smaller fiefs was only possible when it was laid over top of manorialism, right? Manorialism being this method of basically parceling the countryside out into small self-contained pieces, each with its own village, its own common fields and pastures, able to supply its own food and its own necessaries from workshops like a blacksmith and a potter. So once manors had been organized 
across the landscape. That's what made fiefs possible and hence made feudalism possible. So in Stevenson's argument, how did this feudal system come about? Well, it came about in a particular place and time, specifically under the Carolingian rulers of the Frankish Empire in the 700s, and they created this system in order to supply cavalry. That was the point. Right? So the Carolingians in the 700s were trying to extend and shore up a massive empire, and it was at a time when infrastructure was very broken down. The roads and the bridges were bad. It was hard to get together large supplies of food, and hence it was hard to gather and maintain large armies of infantry. And they found that there was a tremendous advantage to being able to fight with small mobile bands that didn't need a lot of food and supplies and that could easily traverse the landscape. And that, most of all, meant a huge advantage to horsemen, warriors on horseback who could move swiftly across difficult terrain, meet enemies, and basically strike down or mow down opponents on foot. So there was a huge premium on good cavalry, or what we would call knights. But knights were very costly. They need good horses, horses that have been carefully bred and trained in good health. They need a lot of arms and armor, and the knights themselves need a lot of training. And they need servants and retainers, people who can get these knights into their armor and up on their horses, and so on and so forth. So you find that in the Middle Ages, a single manor could at best support just one knight. And there was no getting around this difficulty of the massive amount of labor and resources it took to maintain even just one well-trained knight because there was no good reliable source of cash in the early Middle Ages. There was no extensive cash or market economy. Even the markets that existed tended to work more by barter. So it wasn't possible for a single ruler like, say, Charlemagne to simply build up a big treasury and then pay fighters to ride off and fight his wars. Rather, they had to find another way of supporting their knights and making sure that they were adequately fed and supplied and prepared to go into battle. So the easiest way to do that was to dole out manners and basically give knights the power to demand goods and labor from those different manners in return for being prepared to fight on horseback. So hence, in Stevenson's argument, this is the origin of fiefs, of the granting of fiefs, and hence it's the origin of feudalism. It starts in the 8th century in the Carolingians' empire. And this strategy of managing fighters slowly spread and became common and even standard around most of the medieval West from the 9th to the 13th centuries. It was very prevalent and standardized, particularly in France, including especially in Normandy, in the northwest of France. And then, naturally enough, the Normans then brought this system to England after they invaded and conquered England in 1066. So as feudalism developed from its beginnings in the 700s under the Carolingians on up through the 1000s, the 1100s, there was an increasing elaboration and definition of specific reciprocal duties. What do lords and their vassals owe to one another? For instance, vassals must attend to special events around the lord's household. If he's having a son knighted or if he's having a daughter married, the vassals must attend and they must give gifts of money to help pay for these big events. They also have to supply a set number of fighting men for their lord for up to 40 days each year when called upon. So this was, this was basically the quota because supplying and feeding a knight and his whole retinue for more than 40 days would probably completely bankrupt a manor. So it was set at 40 days. And the knight, when he went to war, had to supply his own food, his own horses, his own weapons, bring his own servants, etc. As for law and justice, vassals were judged 
by laws that they agreed upon. They were not simply under the whim or arbitrary power of their lords. They had to agree to laws and rules, and if they were accused of a crime, they would be judged by their peers, other vassals of the same lord, who would gather together in the lord's court. And this arguably is the beginning of the custom of trial by jury, jury of your peers. It was almost impossible for an ordinary commoner to become a vassal because there was such a tremendous barrier of expense, particularly of horses and of learning horsemanship. Horses were by far more valuable than any other livestock by an order of magnitude. So some regular peasant couldn't reasonably become a vassal because he couldn't get together the necessary resources to serve as a knight. And hence, thief holding more and more became limited to an entrenched upper class, and the status of being a vassal and holding a thief over time became hereditary. It was understood that it would be passed on from father to son. That became the norm. But not always. If the son didn't want to take up the titles and duties of his father, he didn't have to. It was voluntary, but it was honorable and it was a rarefied position. So by the High Middle Ages, you have a strong class divide where peasants are peasants and nobles are nobles and vassals are noble, period. Also by the High Middle Ages, it is so desirable to be the vassal of a powerful or honorable lord. And for lords, it's so desirable to have many vassals that people were sort of doing it all over the place there was a, an increasingly complex network of lords and vassals, and it became pretty common, especially for knights, to be the vassals of several lords at once. You didn't necessarily just have one lord. You might pledge homage and fealty to several, and that could cause problems. What if one more than one lord called upon you for service? Or what if different lords tried to subject you to different rules and laws? And in order to get around this problem, vassals had to choose a liege lord. So if you had more than one lord, you would select one of them as your liege lord, meaning your sort of supreme lord to whom you owed the ultimate duty and loyalty. So the advantages of this feudal system is that rulers, whether kings or barons or potentates, could leverage their land, their land claims, and their prestige and their personal bonds and relationships in order to get the military service that they needed rather than having to pay cash, which was so difficult and unreliable. So it's a way of defending and garrisoning your domains without having to pay cash. Now, the catch, as you might imagine, is that later in the Middle Ages, as the market economy grows, as trade among towns and cities grows, cash did become more available. And as it did so, feudalism declined. More and more powerful rulers didn't want to have to deal with all of these complicated customs regulating their relationships with their vassals, and they didn't want to have to call on some vassal hundreds or thousands of miles away when they were leaping into war. So it became more common to simply hire mercenaries and also to, to hire professional administrators like lawyers and scribes who could then administer justice, manage warfare. So more and more these roles that vassals would have played of, of both military service and kind of administrative service to their lords was taken up instead by hired hands. And the feudal relationship and the power of vassalage diminished until by the 1500s, it's basically irrelevant. Okay, so what should we take away from Carl Stevenson's explanation of what feudalism was and when and where and why it happened? It's a specific set of customs regulating the use of land and resources aimed at the mustering of armed men it came about in a specific time and place for a narrow purpose, which is supplying cavalry. And it was definitely not an encompassing social system. All sorts of people, all sorts of land and so forth are not part of it. If you were a traveling musician, you're not part of feudalism. If you're a monastery, you're not part of feudalism. These things have nothing to do with you. If you're not a lord or a vassal or in the direct service of a lord or a vassal, you're not doing a feudalism. Feudalism is not the same as manorialism or the same thing as agrarian society. 
manorialism is much more common, prevalent, and normal throughout Europe, whether or not feudalism is happening, right? The power that lords have over peasants within a manor and the work that peasants do, the reaping and sowing and the three-field rotation system and the common grazing lands, all of that is just part of the functioning of a manor. It is not feudal law. It is not feudalism, and it can go on without feudalism. Not all the land in the medieval West was fiefs. There was land that was allodial, that belonged exclusively to a specific owner with no duties to any sort of superior lord and that they could manage and dispose of however they wanted. There was church land. There was unclaimed land. There were all sorts of things that went on, and there were many manors that were not necessarily part of any fief. So manorialism, again, is not the same thing as feudalism in this definition. And if you want to say there was a mode of production that defined the Middle Ages, that mode of production was manorial agriculture. And feudalism was merely about lords and vassals. But feudalism couldn't happen without manorialism. Manorialism was prior to and necessary for feudalism to be stuck on top of it. Serfdom, again, is not connected to it at all. It is not necessary materially or conceptually. And Stevenson spells out and really emphasizes in his book, feudalism is not a form of civilization or a form of economy. He explains at one point in his argument, quote, By feudalism, we properly refer to the peculiar association of vassalage with fiefholding that was developed in the Carolingian Empire and then spread to other parts of Europe. It should not be thought of as a necessary or even usual stage in economic history. Although feudal institutions presupposed certain agrarian arrangements, the latter were not themselves feudal. So he's trying to spell out here this narrow definition that he's laid out, rooted in the medieval usage of the word feudal, does not fit with the Marxist notion of feudalism. So this view rules out the idea of feudalism as a civilization or form of human life. It rules out the Marxian notion of feudalism as the agrarian stage of civilization before capitalism. And it rules out the idea that other societies like Tokugawa Japan or Aztec Mexico were feudal. So let's say if we want a definition, a notion of feudalism, that is specific and seems as if it should apply clearly and directly and help to explain how medieval society worked, Carl Stevenson's should be it. And this is one of the two really defining works that people point to for a clear elucidation of what feudalism means. So what are the problems? What's wrong? with this Stevenson-style narrow definition of feudalism. Well, this brings us to the second problem that I brought up when I was talking about Andy, Bobby, and Charlie. And that is the fact that the story of feudalism as instantiated in Andy, Bobby, and Charlie and described and delineated in Carl Stevenson's book never happened. It simply does not correspond to any actual recorded events. And you might say, well, nonetheless, it makes sense as a kind of ideal type that loosely approximates reality, that this is roughly what we mean, and that we can make a generalization that things like the story of Andy, Bobby, and Charlie happened, and that's what we mean by feudalism. But the thing about generalizations is that they are claims about reality, and they have to be tested against reality. If the facts do not illustrate that the generalization holds true, then it doesn't work. So if we go back to that core definition that Stevenson made, that feudalism is the union of vassals with fiefs, a sworn servant who gives homage and fealty to his lord, and in return he has a fief, that union never happened. So just to cut to the chase, and I'll explain more how this debate has unfolded, but just to cut to the chase, the scholar Susan Reynolds, 
published a book in 1994 called Fiefs and Vassals, The Medieval Evidence Reinterpreted. And in this, she combs through the actual surviving references to fiefs and vassalage in various different societies, France, Germany, England, through the Middle Ages. And she finds that the actual recorded information does not support the model at all. Instead, there is a chaos of changing and varying local practices, laws, and customs that do not form a coherent pattern and do not have any traceable origin point. Nowhere in the Middle Ages was there an explicit or spelled out sense of an exchange of land or a benefice of land being granted in return for military service. This makes for a cool story. It seems to help explain why it is that there were nobles and knights who held fiefs and owed military service to their lords. But there was never any exchange. Those two things didn't necessarily coincide and were not necessarily understood as having any particular connection to one another. So let's get down to the first term vassal or vassalage. The word vassal was used often in medieval Europe, or at least some form of the word. And it seems as if the main forerunner of it was an old French word, vasus, which was used quite a lot in the Carolingian era in the 8th and 9th centuries in the Frankish Empire. And later it was taken up also in Italy and continued to be common in Italy through much of the Middle Ages. Although in other societies like Germany, England, the Low Countries, Spain, it was very rare and died out after the Carolingian era. This word, vassal or vasus or whatever version you want to point to, it was very frequently used without meaning a servant who gave homage and swore homage and fealty to his lord. It didn't necessarily mean that, and it wasn't necessarily a fighter. It could be any sort of person who did any sort of labor. And rather, it seems the word vasus or vassal most of the time was used very broadly to mean man or fellow or good chap, somebody that you trusted and who could fill a sort of honorable or middling position maybe in a royal or noble household, or maybe just in a workshop or on the estate of a church body, any number of places and functions. So medieval historians in the 20th century, increasingly when they examined how and when people used this term vassal, they found that it was very ambiguous and variable. The definition of vassal had to keep being broadened and stretched to try to still keep it usable. And as the scholar Susan Reynolds herself points out, different scholars would try to come up with vague terms like the vassal just means, quote, men who were bound by some fairly honorable tie of subordination. But that could apply to all sorts of people. As Susan Reynolds herself argues, she says, quote, the concept of vassalage conceals at least half a dozen different types of relation that need to be distinguished. They are those of ruler and subject, patron and client, landlord and tenant, employer and employee, military officer and soldier, and something like a local boss or bully and his victim. So if nothing else, this tremendous ambiguity of vassal shows that it was not really a formal legalistic term and it was never wedded to fiefs. A vassal could just be somebody who did labor for their neighbor, uh, but was not considered servile by virtue of that, was still somehow free or honorable in some way, and might be millions of miles away from having anything like a fief. So let's turn then to that second term in the traditional definition of feudalism, which is actually related at root to the word feudalism, fief. Well, fief in the Middle Ages was just a general word for a territory over which someone has some sort of rights or prerogatives. It is not necessarily held by a vassal, and it is not necessarily held with military service being owed in return. The oldest fiefs that we can trace references to back in the medieval documents seem to have been held from time immemorial. And they weren't necessarily 
attached to the obligation of fighting. Now, there were some military fiefs. It does seem that we can trace points where vassals of some sort were granted a fief in return for military service, and those were granted by the church. This practice of military fiefing granted on church land because the church by the high middle ages was not supposed to fight. And even if there wasn't a general prohibition on fighting, usually bishops and monks were a little busy with other things and not the best trained in warfare. So church bodies were the first, as far as we can see in the records, to make a grant of a fief with the expectation that the grantee will then render you military protection. That doesn't mean necessarily that's what fiefs always were or that's where they began, but that at least is one phenomenon that did happen. Now, most importantly, the concept of fief, as it's defined by Carl Stevenson and these feudal historians, the concept of fief has a story, an origin story built into it. The notion that at some point rulers granted out benefices with parcels of land in return for military service by knights. Well, that origin story is all wrong. There are simply no actual records of rulers ever granting fiefs to vassals in return for the expectation of military service. Rather, fief tenures seem to just go back into the mist of, mists of time. And lords and nobles who held fiefs probably did so because at some point in the past, their forebears had just seized some territory by force or had offered to the residents of a certain territory to organize their protection in return for rents and fees and so forth. It was something that happened on the ground due to local arrangements and then later was confirmed ceremonially by superior lords. It did not happen because rulers decided to grant out parcels of land. There's just no evidence that that ever happened. Now, it's true that a fief could be revoked if a knight failed to pay homage to his lord or to give service to his lord. That did happen. That was commonly understood to be a normal practice. But in that way, the fiefdom is just like all other forms of property and territory and benefice and office holding. All of those rights and privileges could always be seized if you disobeyed your king. And if you failed in your duties and obligations to your king, your property, your titles could be forfeit. That fact does not mean that all of those rights and prerogatives were originally granted or parceled out by the king. And it doesn't mean that there was understood to be a reciprocal contract between the king and the person who holds a benefice or an office or a property. Hence, we can say this story of vassalage being specially linked to fiefs and this linkage coming about due to military grants of fiefs is wrong. On the one hand, as I said, there's no evidence of any of that happening. And also, it clearly can't be right. It's not plausible because it completely misconstrues the situation in the early Middle Ages when these feudal laws or customs started to develop. Kings did not have an abundance of land but lack fighting men. Rather, the pattern was the reverse. They had good bands of fighters around them, but they lacked control over land. So hence, what might have happened, insofar as rulers and kings were even involved in this process at all, what probably happened is that those kings and emperors and rulers, who really had very little power on the ground beyond a little local area, they were willing to allow warlords, potentates, fighters out there in the far-flung countries to have a certain degree of control over their little local areas, as long as they still recognized the supremacy and supreme authority of the king, which they might enact and dramatize through ceremonies. So it's not as if the king had some power to say, I have Aquitaine, I'm giving you Aquitaine, go out there and take up possession of it, and then come back and fight for me when I call on you. It probably was more like, you know what, we have no real control over Aquitaine. Whatever goes on there, we're just going to have to allow it. But try to persuade 
that local warlord who controls Aquitaine to at least give us some gesture of recognition that we are their superior lord. And that's probably where those ceremonies came from. And this makes much more sense in line with what we know and understand about medieval kingship, that medieval kingship was really ceremonial more than territorial. And the king was revered more as a symbolic leader when what really went on on the ground was more in the hands of local elites. Okay, so if there was no particular marriage or link between vassalage and fiefdom, and if those words have both been wildly misconstrued, and this whole origin story about kings handing out fiefs to their vassals is all wrong, how did historians get it so wrong? How did it come about that a smart and knowledgeable historian like Carl Stevenson, who was a foremost expert in medieval society, spun this whole story that really has no examples in it and no illustrations and completely doesn't fit the evidence? How did this happen? Well, when Carl Stevenson and others like him set about trying to explain feudalism, they were already from the beginning adopting a certain mindset and a certain set of assumptions and a certain lens that they would then use to view the evidence and to fit the evidence into a preconceived story, which is something people are very good at doing, right? We all have very strong confirmation bias and we make the evidence in front of us look like what we want. This was probably a big case of when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So scholars like Stevenson were already primed to believe that there was such a thing as feudalism and that it basically worked the way Stevenson described it. And hence, when they look through medieval records, they might find all kinds of very vague, ambiguous documents, and they read into them what they want to see. And this leads then to a lot of circular reasoning. For example, you might imagine having a conversation with someone like Carl Stevenson and say, what do we know about feudalism? And he might say, well, we know that vassals held fiefs and they always paid homage to their superior lords in return for their fiefs. Well, how do you know that this is what happened? And he might say, well, there are many examples. For example, Harold Godwinson paid homage and fealty to his superior lord, Edward the Confessor, in return for his fief, which was Wessex. And then you might ask, well, how do you know that Harold Godwinson performed homage and fealty to King Edward the Confessor in return for his fief? And Stevenson might say, well, we know that because Harold Godwinson was a vassal, and vassals always paid homage for their fiefs. So you see how you can just fill in the missing parts of the story in order to always make it fit your model. And you know that your examples fit your model and they support your model because you know your model is true and hence the examples must fit it. It's a massive circular reasoning and it's very easy to do this when you're examining the Middle Ages, which is an era with very few and vague and fragmentary records, especially the early Middle Ages when this whole feudal system supposedly came about. So it's not hard to shape those limited sources into what you want to see. And when you do this, you can create, and feudalism is not the only example of this, you can create these massive structures of evidence and claims and generalizations and specifics that are like sandcastles and that simply collapse when you examine them. And this, I would say, is more or less what's happened with the concept of feudalism. This structure has been built up over centuries and then in recent decades, when it's been really thoroughly examined, it has fallen apart. Okay, so let's back up and say a little more of how did this actually happen? Who built up this idea of feudalism and how and why? So if we go back to the early Middle Ages before 1100, we see that there was a whole complex variety of ties of service and duty and loyalty that were sometimes taken for granted or sometimes promoted and pushed upon the people in the early medieval world. There was also a whole variety of forms of landholding, different overlapping powers and prerogatives that different people might have in zones of territory. 
there was no single set standard of how you manage a piece of land. One way that land sometimes was held and exploited was that some powerful nobles and fighters and knights might have rights and prerogatives over zones that they called fiefs. But there was no very consistent meaning or standard of who has a fief and on what terms and what they can or can't do with it. Now in the 1100s, teams of lawyers began to codify the different rules and powers that people could have over land, particularly over fiefs. And when these lawyers combed through records and surveyed customs and started to try to set out codes of rules, they tended to emphasize the royal and imperial authority and argue that ultimately the nitty gritty of what you do with land and what you do with people who live on land is actually up to the crown. And this process began particularly in Italy where the earliest law schools and then universities were formed in the Middle Ages. So you may remember in my first lecture about the origins of universities, I talked about how the first universities started in northern Italy in Padova and Bologna, particularly aimed at training lawyers. And there was a demand for lawyers because northern Italy was the sort of far edge frontier of the Holy Roman Empire. And there were all kinds of confusions and disputes over the extent of the Holy Roman Emperor's authority in Italy. So lawyers could make a good living and get a good job if they were trained and prepared to make arguments in courts supporting the claims of the emperor as against the various local rulers and potentates that had this kind of patchwork of domains all over Italy. So these lawyers in northern Italy in the 1100s put forward an argument that if a lord held a domain called a fief, they ultimately held it at the pleasure of the crown. It had been granted originally by the crown, it could be limited by the crown, and it could be revoked by the crown. And they put these arguments along with all kinds of case law and histories and legal tracts, they put these together into a book called the Libri Feudorum. And this Libri Feudorum could be used by many different lawyers all over the place to make arguments in favor of the crown or higher, more powerful lords as against the claims of lower level fief holders. And crucially, the book includes a little introduction with a short conjectural history speculating about the origins of fiefs. And this book puts forward this idea that it started from the Carolingians when the Carolingian rulers in the 8th and 9th centuries would grant fiefs to their vassals on certain limited terms and conditions. Where did they get that idea from? Was it based in some sort of facts? Were they just completely pulling it out of thin air? Who knows? But it's totally conjectural. Now, the Libri Feodorum was extremely influential then in sort of setting up this whole legal apparatus around fiefs in the high and late Middle Ages. And after 1500, agents and representatives of the crown in different countries also found it useful and found this sort of little conjectural history useful for their arguments. So in the 1500s, teams of French jurists working for the French crown, which also was very aggressively and diligently trying to extend its power and suppress the power of local nobles and potentates, they took this theory from the Libri Feudorum and ran with it. And they argued that feudal law had supposedly originated from barbarian Germanic customs, like the ones described as the Comitatus in Tacitus's History of Germania, and hence it was not rooted in Roman law, hence it never had any authority or legitimacy in France, and hence it could be modified or revoked at will by the crown. In this view, there were no real local rights. There were no inherent rights and powers held by local nobles or rulers over their territories or 
the commoners on their territories. Everything ultimately rested in the hands of the crown. And these French jurists emphasized this idea that it all had started from the Carolingian rulers giving out fiefs to their vassals, which they could revoke at will. So after 1600, this same basic idea, this same basic notion of feudal law or feudal customs, then carried over and was taken up by new waves and new generations of reformers. So particularly in England, ideas about property were changing and more and more commoners were coming into power. They had a new voice in the parliament. They had new power at court and they wanted to promote the idea that land holding and uh, property was exclusive. So what medievals had called allodial property, sort of private, privately held property that the owner can use however they wish uh, with no sort of reciprocal duties or rights owed to anybody else. These sort of commoner, you might say bourgeois lawyers and jurists and politicians wanted to make that the sort of normal understanding of what property was held by one owner with little or no duties to be disposed of however the owner wants. And this basic ideal of property, of course, is impossible and has never been realized. All property rights, even today, are only partial and conditional. There are things like eminent domain, property taxes, if you don't pay it, it can be seized from you, uh, zoning laws limiting what you can do with a piece of property. So property has always been, in the Middle Ages through the modern era, has always been a social arrangement where different parties have different claims. But the notion, the idea that property was simple and exclusive and belonged just to one private owner, this was the ideal that these new jurists in the 1600s, especially in England, were trying to promote. And it also could be used to argue against the claims of noble landholders, right? Local potentates like dukes, or for that matter, church bodies that tried to charge rents or fees or services from the commoners. And so it was politically useful for these English politicians and jurists in the 1600s to cast these sort of old duties and conditions placed upon landholding as feudal, in quotation marks, and to cast them as outmoded and to try to get them abolished or reduced. Well, meanwhile, a similar process started in France, which worked a little differently. In England, these so-called feudal tenures could be dismantled or abolished through legislation, through parliament. In France, it was done more through juridical arguments, legal arguments presented in courts and councils called parlements. And these arguments would define and attack what they called first feudal law and then sometimes later feudalism. And these feudal rules and laws, which in, on the one hand, protected vassals and other holders of benefices, but on the other hand, required them to give some sort of service. These practices were gradually undone bit by bit in the 1700s. But something else was left that still was not touched until 1789. And that was what about the special prerogatives and powers that these local nobles have over their local domains, whether they're called fiefs or not? And what about the special duties of service or fees in kind that peasants might owe to nobles? That had not always been considered part of feudal law. It was only in the 1700s that people start to talk about those rules and customs also as feudal or belonging under this heading of the feudal system. And those were attacked finally in 1789. So this is the culmination of what you might call the creation and destruction of feudalism. You have to create it as a concept and bring all of these various rules and practices together under that heading and then destroy it. So on August 4th, 1789, 
the National Constituent Assembly of France declared, quote, the National Assembly abolishes the feudal system entirely. So this was a exciting and sweeping pronouncement, and it may seem basically to fit within the Marxist narrative, right? That the French Revolution was a bourgeois revolution for capitalism that overthrew feudalism. But there was a big problem. Most people at the time didn't know what is the feudal system. They had voted to abolish it, but they didn't mostly know for sure what they had just abolished. They certainly were not abolishing agriculture, and they were not abolishing manorialism. So what actually changed with this decree? What was the actual effect of it? Well, for weeks there was extreme confusion. People didn't know, and they were debating and in a bit of a panic over what exactly the feudal system was, and that had to be hammered out over the next several months through 1789 and 1790. And increasingly, members of the assembly came to certain agreements that the feudal system meant the special rights and privileges of lords, such as the exclusive ability to keep birds and game on their estates, and those were abolished. The condition of serfdom was abolished, although really nobody by that time in France was a serf, and also all kinds of fees and dues and rents and tithes that commoners might owe to their lords or to the church were ended. Now, it's not quite right to say they were abolished. Rather, they were ended, but it was understood that they were to be redeemed, meaning that the holders of these special prerogatives of collecting fees and dues and rents would have to be compensated, and that tenants would have to pay the taxes to fund those compensations to landlords. This caused anger and frustration when bit by bit the word leaked out to the rest of the country that these indemnities would have to be paid. And so they were later canceled. They were highly controversial and they were canceled finally in 1793 as the more radical phase of the French Revolution began. Now, in addition to this, the special rights of guilds and of towns and cities were also abolished. So the ability of towns and cities to set their own uh, taxes and ordinances, the ability of guilds to regulate trades and license practitioners of trades, those were also eventually abolished under this heading of abolishing the feudal system. It's not clear why, <laughs> you know, it, you, it arguably might fit with this sort of drive towards a more capitalist society, in quotation marks, where there simply are no special rights and prerogatives, and where you have some sort of free trade in goods and labor. But, you know, at the same time, you could see those rights and powers of towns and cities and of guilds as fitting into a bourgeois capitalist society. And indeed, many modern societies still have these. There are still licensing requirements set by professional organizations like the AMA, and towns and cities still have the right to charge their own taxes and fees. So for some reason, those rules and powers were also eventually abolished. And by implication, it seems they were understood to fall under that heading of feudal system. So it seems as if the basic overarching idea that was brought to bear when the French revolutionaries were getting rid of the so-called feudal system was that they wanted to eliminate all special rights and prerogatives that belonged to particular persons or groups. And they wanted to substitute in a more individualistic, uniform and equal system of rights and duties. And in this way, it was very much consonant with later actions like the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, which laid out a whole long list of rights and prerogatives that belonged to all men. And of course, you know, that leaves open the question of whether those apply to women. But it seems as if there was an idea here that man, mankind, men, should all be legally on a level and special rights and prerogatives should be swept away, and all of those could be labeled under this heading of feudal. 
So this basic understanding of feudal, it seems, was then taken up later in the 19th century by German philosophers, by Hegelians, who were interested in a dialectical story of history where different reigning ideas sort of uh, define eras before they are then disrupted and overthrown by their antithesis. And in this Hegelian view, they took up the notion that the Middle Ages were a coherent age and that the feudal system was the defining, encompassing system of that era. And so naturally, that system had to be overthrown by a new modern system with an opposite or contrasting ideology. And this Hegelian dialectical philosophy was taken up in a different way by Marx. So Marx takes up this style of history, but he refocuses it on material and economic relations and on class conflict. So in his view, the base driving the development of a civilization and its overthrow is fundamentally the material mode of production. So in Marx's view, the agrarian age before industry. The agrarian age is represented by the Middle Ages, and feudalism is its mode of production. And naturally, this precedes then the Industrial Age and capitalism as the new mode of production. And so you could see ruptures like the French Revolution as a case of the capitalist bourgeoisie overthrowing the old feudal aristocracy whose power was rooted in the old system. Now, we should question, as I mentioned before, we should question what does it mean for feudalism to be a mode of production? Does that mean that feudalism, in Marx's view, simply means farming or animal husbandry? Or does it mean manorialism? Or does it mean a particular strategy of agricultural production, like three-field rotation? Or is he using feudalism more in the medieval sense of feudal, which means specifically the relations of fiefs. The word feudal, as I said, originally comes from the granting of fiefs and the legal arrangements that were overlaid on top of manorialism, at least according to the medieval legal scholars. So if you look at the roots of the word and where it came from, it is not in any sense a mode of production. Right? Production of food and craft work went on on manors, completely irrespective of feudal law in the original sense. So perhaps Marx might have avoided confusion by saying manorialism instead of feudalism. Right? That manorialism is the mode of production that has been replaced by trade and large-scale industry and wage labor. But why didn't he do this? Why did he say feudalism? Well, maybe it's because he wanted to borrow the negative connotations that by that time were closely attached to feudal. And he wanted, ironically, you might say, he wanted to draw on bourgeois resentment towards the old noble privileges and prerogatives, which increasingly were referred to as feudal. And like the French revolutionaries and like the French and English jurists before the French Revolution, Marx also portrayed the overthrow of the feudal system as a kind of progress and a leap forward into the modern world. So feudal customs, again, if we use the original root definition, feudal customs and agrarianism are separable. And manorialism and agrarianism existed long before feudalism. And we can see more specific examples like the 1660 Tenures Abolition Act, which I discussed before, which was passed in England during the Restoration. That act, you could say, abolished feudalism in England, but it had zero effect on agricultural production. It had nothing to do with what was being done on the land, what was being produced, it was about who owed service versus money to the crown. So from 1900 through to today, the idea of feudal customs was basically used as a tool in order to stamp out certain surviving laws and practices in Europe. So it was basically under these conditions then, in this atmosphere, that academics started to actually examine the Middle Ages themselves and to see how 
the concept of feudal or feudalism might actually apply to what happened in the Middle Ages. And one thing that happened, by and large, is that the Marxian definition of feudalism was pretty quickly discarded. It simply did not fit the actual facts on the ground. If you want to know what was the mode of production of medieval society, that was, first of all, agriculture on manors, and secondly, it also involved a lot of trade and commerce and industry. There was something of an industrial revolution in the 12th and 13th centuries. So manorialism, agriculture, trade, industry in mills and forges and foundries and shipyards, all of those things went on in the Middle Ages, and they have little or nothing to do with so-called feudal law. Nonetheless, some scholars did still try to use the term feudalism as a kind of broad catch-all term for a social or political system, how society was organized, the hierarchy, uh, the power of landholding. And in these scholars' hands, the definition, you could say, kept getting broader and more abstract, that it somehow meant you know, ties of duty and loyalty affecting everybody, including merchants and churchmen and artists and so on. And the very influential historian Mark Bloch in 1939 wrote a book on feudalism where he used it as a catch-all term for an unequal society with powerful nobles. Now, many critics made many objections to this way of talking about feudalism they pointed out that it simply couldn't apply in many places and times or to many phenomena. There were places like, say, the medieval Italian republics, where there was a certain equality among citizens, and there were no oaths of fealty and homage to some lord. Uh, and this idea that there's a single all-encompassing system that includes the nuns in the convent and the traveling jugglers and the merchant coming up to the manor, that all of these things fit into one single system, it more and more weakened as scholars poked holes in it with careful research, showing that it couldn't actually describe the complexity of what was really happening in real medieval society. And hence, more and more doubts arose about what could be the correct meaning of feudalism and whether it was a useful term at all. Very quickly after Mark Bloch's book, there was an effort then to pare back the meaning and to argue that feudalism, in fact, could be useful if it was applied to a very specific range of phenomena based on feudal law. And the two landmark books that tried to define feudalism in this stricter sense were Stevenson's book that I discussed from 1942 and another by a French scholar named Ganshoff in 1944. But still, the problem persisted because specific cases, even of lordship and vassalage and fiefholding, they didn't seem to really fit this model from Stevenson and Ganshoff. If you look at Stevenson's book, it cites only a very few specific examples, all of which are vague and incomplete. So this opened up arguments that, in fact, the whole concept might be useless. It was too vague to try to apply to all of medieval society, and it also was too narrow to fit any real, actual, substantive examples. And so in 1974, the American historian Elizabeth Brown published a major watershed article called The Tyranny of a Construct, where she basically argued that we have to stop talking about feudalism. There's just no particular thing that really happened that fits this model, and we're doing a disservice by trying to twist the evidence to fit this or that feudalism. And this created a huge split and controversy in the field, which to some degree still goes on. But 20 years later, the British scholar Susan Reynolds, who is extremely erudite and versed in the medieval records, much as Carl Stevenson was, she published a book called Fiefs and Vassals, which I've already talked about and quoted from, which actually picks through the medieval records and totally deconstructs the idea that anything like Carl Stevenson's feudalism really happened on the ground. So, in my view at least, Reynolds' work really blows apart 
this idea that we can say medieval society was feudal or that it was shaped by some system that we can call feudalism. It just isn't true. It's a false myth. But nonetheless, the popular press and the public consciousness at large still tends to use the concept and even take it for granted. People, one of the first things people will say when you ask what was the Middle Ages, they'll say feudal or feudalism. And you can see an interesting example of this kind of continuing myth of feudalism in the way that people discuss and report about very minor and arcane legal changes that were made on a small island in the English Channel called Sark, which many people will tell you was a holdout of feudalism, quote unquote. So Sark is a small island that is part of the Channel Islands, so they belong in some way to the, the British Crown, although they are technically not part of the UK. And Sark is an island that still today has a hereditary seigneur, or lord, who holds the islands as a fief from the crown. And it seems that the island was originally granted to some lord by Queen Elizabeth in the 1500s. So not during the supposed heyday of feudalism, but much later. It was granted as some sort of a fief to a lord, and then the lord recognized 40 tenants or residents with some sort of property right on the island, but who were somehow subordinate to the seigneur. And it seems that certain customs of, say, the tenants, for instance, giving a chicken each year to the lord, these persisted into the 19th century and then were revived again during World War II when the island was occupied by Nazis. And the dame or lady of Sark decided to revive and demand these contributions of food and other supplies from the residents in order to build up a stash to help resist Nazi occupation. And actual governing power on the island was really not held by the lord or lady of Sark, but rather it was in the hands of a council called the Chief Please, which was a, simply a council of the 40 tenants. And this Chief Please had the actual ability to govern and legislate for the island until it was abolished and replaced in 2008. And in that year, a new bill transferred that power of making and enforcing criminal law from the chief pleas to the government of Guernsey, a larger neighboring island. So you could, if you want to, you could see this island of Sark as a last holdout of feudalism. And for example, the British newspaper, The Telegraph, had a headline saying that reform, quote, brings an end to the last feudal state in Europe. And Reuters said, quote, Sark ends 450 years of feudalism. This hopefully should raise some questions in your mind. For instance, isn't it bizarre that this supposedly feudal state of Sark was started in the 1500s and lasted until 2008? In other words, has zero overlap with the Middle Ages when feudalism was supposedly the defining system. And that this supposed feudal governance that happened on Sark apparently looks basically like democracy. You know, each of the 40 tenants has the right to sit on a council and make laws and adjudicate for the island. The only thing that marks it out as not simply a little democracy is the fact that there's somebody with the title of Lord who has some very, very minor ceremonial powers like expecting the tenants on the island to give her a chicken. But that sort of old-fashioned right and prerogative, you could say, is enough to signal in our minds that what we're looking at here is feudalism, and that this feudalism is something ancient, it's a holdover, and it's somehow incompatible with our beliefs and laws and systems today, right? So I think this illustrates how feudalism has become this grab bag term for any sort of laws or customs that involve inequality, that involve somebody rendering something to their supposed 
social superior, whether that person is appointed or hereditary. And so it seems connected to specific roles or duties recognized in law or custom. And these practices, like giving a chicken to the Lord of Sark, can seem strange and alien and even barbaric in contrast to our present idea of equality before the law. And so in this way, feudal, you might say, can only exist as a concept, at least today, feudal and feudalism can only survive as concepts in contrast to and in contradistinction to the things we implicitly believe today of democracy, the rule of law, equality before the law, in the same way that you could say the concept of raw is only comprehensible if you have it in contrast to the concept of cooked. If you're in a world where nobody is cooking, then there's no such thing as raw. But that doesn't mean that therefore raw is a coherent concept governed by some sort of principles or practices. There's no such thing as, uh, as a, the raw system or rawism, although there is rawism now in the form of people who commit themselves to eat only raw food. But nonetheless, raw food in and of itself is not an ism. It's just a category in contrast to some other category. And so the feudalism myth is really tied to the Middle Ages myth. We can understand feudalism, broadly speaking, when we actually use the term. We seem to be just referring to legally codified inequalities attached to social stations that are abhorrent to modern people and that we reject today, especially the literate middle classes, the sort of people who demanded legal reforms from the 1600s up to the 2000s, who uh, resented and opposed the special roles and prerogatives of the noble class. So these sorts of things, even if they really have nothing to do with each other, can be grouped together under this label of feudalism. They can be cast as barbaric, benighted, and archaic, and inimical to modernity. So basically, in conclusion, humans, as I've said before, are pattern-making creatures. We want to see repeating patterns and harmonies and structure, even where there isn't any. Like when we look at a cloud and say that cloud looks like a rabbit, even though it's completely formless. When we look at an era in the past, like the Middle Ages, we want to know what was the Middle Ages all about? What was the defining ideology or system or regime or mode of production? And feudalism can conveniently fill in this blank. What was the system that governed and defined the Middle Ages? It must be something with an ism on the end of it, and so that's feudalism. But maybe really there was none. Right? Modern people tend to think that law and government should be justified in abstract, generalizable terms. We should have written laws that codify rights, and there should be guiding principles like democracy and equality before the law and due process of law that define and set guardrails on the entire functioning of society. But medievals didn't necessarily think that. For them, laws and customs could be justified historically and in personal terms by personal relationships, roles, and precedents. The fact that some particular vassal owed military service to his lord didn't mean that every vassal owed that same service to every lord. It was just something that had been written into that particular personal relationship. So moderns tend to want to impose a single order on how society works and to group these different relations and customs into a system that can be explained and justified by abstract principles. But the evidence when it comes to the Middle Ages tends to say that there simply was none. More specifically, the Libri Feudorum fills a role for modern scholars. It seems to provide those abstract general principles that shaped relations and practices. But the Libri Feudorum was a legal handbook. It was created due to the lack of consistency and the confusion at the time. And it seems that it wasn't actually honored in practice in general. 
it was an ideal set of standards that didn't really match real events. And looking at the Libri Feudorum and thinking that it can tell you about feudalism as it was practiced in the Middle Ages is a lot like a person in the near future reading a dating handbook or a dating advice column from today and reading that some writer says when you go on a dinner date, you should split the bill. And then concluding, so therefore dating is a system where when you have a friendly dinner with someone, you split the bill. Now, as I hope is clear, this is not a reason to conclude that this was actually done. And even if it was done, it doesn't mean that it was the norm or that it was always done. It just means that somebody wanted to tell people that that's what you ought to do. And that this was one way of approaching a sort of broad, variable, undefined social practice that we call dating. Dating is certainly very widespread today, and a lot of people have some kind of similar notion of what it means when you say that. But it's very ill-defined, and it's understood to be constantly changing. And even if someone tries to write down explicitly, you should split the bill, that doesn't mean that therefore there was a system or a law or an ideology of split the bill-ism, and any time two per people on a date split the dinner bill, they're acting out this ideology or system or structure or whatever. It's just one possible variation of an unwritten, changeable social practice. And this is especially true when we're talking about people in the Middle Ages who didn't value abstract legal principles like we do and who were largely illiterate, and even when they went to court, they tended to operate by unwritten customary law. Now, one can say, of course, that there is a sort of broad and malleable medieval worldview. I'm not saying that there isn't some set of ideas and ideals that unite the Middle Ages. If you want to hear my basic description of what I would say that worldview was, you can go back and listen to that one on uh, the pulsating body, the medieval worldview. Even if you believe there is a medieval worldview, Feudalism is not it. <laughs> that is a complete mistake. So why has the myth of feudalism survived? I've talked about how it could be useful in political and legal arguments, but there's a final irony here that we should recognize, which is that present-day society in, let's say, the modern United States is much more materially unequal than medieval society was. In medieval society, there were distinctions between lords and commoners, but the actual differences in wealth and material conditions were much smaller than they are today. Most peasants were not desperately, grindingly poor like we might imagine, and nobles were not mostly that rich. They generally just looked like somewhat more well-to-do peasants. The gradations were not really as big, substantively speaking, as they are in the modern world. And so the myth of feudalism, the idea that the Middle Ages was defined by these horrifying gaps of power where lords just could wield unlimited tyrannical control over their frightened, cowering serfs, that image of feudalism serves to legitimize the inequality of today. It emphasizes the strangeness, the alienness of laws and customs that explicitly recognized inequality. And hence, it makes it possible for the medieval feudal world to serve as our opposite number, the everything that is unlike our supposedly free and equal modern era. And by focusing in on abstract legal doctrines and the explicitly codified reciprocal powers of lords and vassals and peasants, it distracts from and obscures actual material inequality, which, as I've said, is exponentially greater in the modern world and today than it was in the Middle Ages. And so in this way, like most myths, the myth of feudalism helps to explain and justify the world as we see it around us today. So thank you so much again for listening.
And if you want to hear more Myths of the Month, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description and become a supporter at any level. And lastly, this lecture has been a long time coming because of the research and work that I've done and also because the Jewish High Holidays intervened. And so if you want to hear about my views about so-called religion, Judaism, God, I had a nice conversation about that with my friend Michael, which is posted on the podcast Chai, How Are You? And I'll put the link to that in the description as well. Thank you.